thank, thank you for uh, indulging uh, us in that. Um, could not um, give video examples of everything that happened this year, but that's a sampling of some of the great, uh, both the spirit and the successes that, that uh, were enjoyed uh, throughout our college community. And it took everybody, everybody to make it happen. And I couldn't be prouder of the faculty, the staff, and especially our students uh, for getting us to this point. Uh, that together you, we will, uh, it was a t-shirt. We, we made a t-shirt and, and people bought into the t-shirt and the idea and, uh, and they did it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my presentation for celebrating success. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have. Uh, Mr. Chair, can we take comments? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, any, anybody, yeah, comments, go ahead. Christy. Thank you. Uh, well, I would just like to reiterate some of the things that you've said, Dr. McLennan, from the board's perspective. Mm -hmm. Because of our of the administration, faculty, and staff, we were able to continue to serve over 5,000 students. That's 5,000 people in our community that got to keep going to school, got to keep moving forward. Sometimes maybe our policies seemed a little um, more than others, <laughs> but it kept the doors open. We never once had to shut down completely, and that was due to the efforts of everyone on this campus, really wanting to make sure those students got to press on. So kudos to you and your team, and hopefully next year, I love those awards that we got to see. Usually we're there helping give those out, and I'm really hopeful that next year we're back doing that again. Thank, thank you, Trustee Woods. I, I should add that, um, one of the reasons that we wanted to show you this tonight is because a lot of our traditions and our, uh, well, our traditions, we, we really had to adjust them, whether it's commencement or the faculty staff awards, the achievement awards. Um, but out of, out of uh, the adversity does come some opportunity. And one of my great joys this year, twice now, uh, and I'm still in the middle of the second one, has been to deliver the, the um, achievement awards personally to every faculty staff uh, member uh, for their 5, 10, 15, 20 plus year service awards and and it's made it a much more intimate um, interaction and I've certainly got to know people and hear about what their struggles have been and, and, and what their achievements have been throughout the year as well. And so, um, you know, we've, we've, we've done a lot in, in that spirit to make the best out of the situation that we, we had and um, and out of that has come a lot of good as well. So thank you again. Are, are there any other comments? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to the constituent reports. <clears throat> the first one is Asnik. Take a shot at this Annie Vladovska. Uh, go ahead, Annie. Yeah, Annie Vladovska. Um, new ASNIC president, and um, you all of you already seen what the ASNIC have did, has done for this past semester. Uh, two projects has been finished, and the letter of transition for the new officers, upcoming officers for fall 2021. And um, it was a privilege to, for me to work with uh, my amazing team this semester. And we also have uh, two returning students to new returning to returning of the new officers as part of ASNIC group and five more positions are open and we are looking for amazing students to join us. So this is my report for today. Short and sweet. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Any comments or questions? Anything for Annie? All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, next would be uh, Faculty Assembly, Molly. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair Banducci. Um, hi to the Board of Trustees, President McLennan, and distinguished guests and visitors. Um, my name is Molly Mashad. I was recently elected Faculty Assembly Chair. I look forward to working with all of you um, we really don't have a lot to report. We did um, elect Brian Seguin as our treasurer last month. Um, other than that, we just discussed uh, accreditation and 
Um, some looking forward to the adjunct faculty survey report um, coming in August. I will stand for questions if anyone has any. Any questions for Molly? Molly, I don't see any. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Uh, next up is staff assembly. That's Jeff. Go ahead, sir. Oh, unmute myself. Good evening. Uh, Chair Van Ducci, trustees, Dr. McLennan, President's Cabinet, colleagues and guests. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, our latest meeting of the staff assembly, uh, we had the usual housekeeping uh, as well as new employee introductions and the Sterling Silver Award, who went to Amber Haas, Senior Administrative Assistant Communication and Fine Arts Division. We're so proud of her. Uh, fantastic. Uh, shout outs. Uh, as usual, we always have shout outs from our colleagues, uh, which means just folks saying something nice about what people have done and people have contributed in our organization to make it a better place. Uh, we had to create, as it were, a new staff assembly executive committee. Uh, this will be my last evening as chair of staff assembly we will have a new staff assembly chair as Sarah Martin from Workforce Training Center, and we're very excited about that. Uh, vice chair will be Carrie Simone from Workforce Training as well. Uh, staff Achievement Awards nominations went through, and of course, at our yearly meeting of which all you were in attendance, we uh, were able to honor our fellow staff as well as faculty and even some administrators for their excellent work this year. Our guest speaker was a young man who goes by the name of Dr. Rick McLennan. Uh, every year in May, we do try to include the president of the college to give us sort of a wrap up and a, a thoughts on the college as well as what could be coming our way in the future year. Always delightful. And we were so happy to have Dr. McLennan uh, to be able to speak to our folks. Uh, we have our usual Senate report, as well as a report from the President's Advisory Council. And for good of the order, we had a second reading of the amendment to Staff Assembly Constitution <coughs> in uh, creating a parliamentarian, which was passed. And so we'll be looking forward to have a parliamentarian at our meetings. At that point, we wrapped up and adjourned. If there's anyone who has comment or question, I'd, I'd like to entertain that now. Any, any comments or questions for Jeff? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would just thank Jeff for his service. It's been great working with you this year and I hope you have a great summer. He muted himself again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that as an acknowledgement of the compliment. <laughs> Anything else? All right, next. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next, it'll be the Senate. Uh, uh, Melissa, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you're ready. Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, Trustee Banducci and the Board of Trustees, 
uh, President McLennan and other honored guests. My name is Melissa Mwini. I am the very brand new vice chair of uh, Senate. Uh, we started off our last meeting with elections. Um, our former vice chair, Max Mendez, did not accept the nomination for chair. Um, and given discussion, we were not able to fill that. So right now the chair spot is empty. I am serving as vice chair. We have corresponding secretary, Maureen Dolan, and then our parliamentarian, Kristen Howard. Uh, under old business, we did an update on the board policy website. Uh, Ken Wardinsky gave us a update of that. And under new business, we did a first reading of 3.2.17, the fringes policy, and the two procedures that go with it, the employee fringes policy, retiree fringes policy. Um, those will continue on during our next meeting for a second reading. And I believe that is everything from my report. Are there any questions? Thank you, Melissa. Are there any questions for Melissa? I do not see any. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we move on to the President's report. Thank you. I'm going to keep my report brief this evening. I'm only going to focus on uh, one topic, and, and uh, that is the Northwest Commission uh, and Colleges and Universities um, request or investigation uh, that the college uh, has been working on, the response. Uh, and just to, to do that, I want to just set up a little bit about what we're actually responding to, the, the sort of guidance we've gotten from the commission uh, in that regard, and then um, I guess maybe some next steps. Uh, so I guess first of all, we, were, we have been asked to approach this although it's limited in scope in terms of the three eligibility requirements on academic freedom, uh, non-discrimination, and uh, board governance or governance. Um, uh, we've been asked to address those as though we were addressing a full seven-year review, uh, which is what we've done. And, and, and in doing so, because we transitioned right in uh, our last full-scale evaluation that concluded in April of 2020 used the standards, I'll say the old standards, although they really weren't that old, um, and that the, they, those standards no longer exist. They've been replaced by the revised standards uh, by, uh, by which we will be evaluated in our next full-scale uh, scale evaluation. Well, the eligibility requirements don't exactly line up um, directly with the standards so uh, our, it's our um, accreditation liaison, uh, Steve Kurtz, met with uh, our accreditation liaison on the Northwest Commission side, and they went through what, what would those items, what would those standards need to be uh, that we would need to respond to. So we have the three eligibility requirements, which uh, the board has seen. Uh, and then the related standards to those, two of them line up very directly, the standards around academic freedom and institutional governance. And so those lined up fairly straightforward. With respect to non-discrimination, uh, they're sprinkled throughout other standards now. Uh, so there are standards around students' rights and responsibilities, ethics and complaints, uh, conflicts of interest, uh, human resource policies, uh, working conditions, rights and responsibilities of employees, uh, employee evaluations, um, uh, retention, promotion, and termination of employees, and then um, also another section in the catalog around student rights and responsibilities. So uh, what the, execu what the accredi executive accreditation team uh, has done has been to review the complaint and all the documents attached to that uh, through the lens of these standards that connect to the eligibility requirements. Uh, a draft is in process. Uh, it, it, importantly, uh, it will uh, take uh, more shape uh, once uh, we have a better understanding of the board 
uh, the board's response, uh, uh, which I know the board has been working on, um, although that, that group has not seen that response, so it will, by, by necessity, uh, need to adapt to uh, whatever the board is uh, producing by way of its, its statement, its commitment, its acknowledgement, uh, whatever that might look like. When, uh, when, we, when we have that and we complete the draft, I will uh, we'll be sharing it widely, but I'll most certainly share it with the Board of Trustees before we submit it. And that concludes my report. Mr. Chair? Just, just you would. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McLennan, for addressing that for all of us. I would just like to add the board is working on a response, and I'd like to thank uh, Trustee Howard and Trustee Barnes for taking the lead on that and um, helping the board work through this process. Um, I'd also, Mr. Chair, you're under the weather, and sometimes it takes the whole board to help out here. I would like to, if we could, just uh, acknowledge the governor's representative, Jake Geringer, in the back of the room and say, Thank you again. We haven't seen you in a year because we couldn't. But thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Sorry for my oversight. <laughs> um, actually, you're kind of hidden from me. <laughs> thank, thank you, Christy. Um, and, and yes, to that point, uh, my, uh, Trustee Barnes will be, will be reading um, what the uh, Board of Trustees has composed uh, towards the end of the meeting. That will be under uh, remarks for the good of the order. So, and we'll also be, um, uh, well, as I say, we'll also be uh, able to hear from him on KTEC also. So that'll, that'll be nice to <coughs> be blessed by hearing him on two topics. Um, all right. <coughs> Next thing, uh, under old business, uh, tab one, uh, the second a reading action of the fiscal year 22 general fund operating budget uh, and tuition and fees and that will be by uh, Vice President uh, Chris Martin. Chair Banducci, members of the board, thank you very much for the opportunity to come before you tonight to, to discuss the second reading of the FY22 general operating budget. So based off of our conversations we've had from the first reading, um, the workshop, um, there's been no substantive changes to the budget from what was presented in in April and just would highlight a couple of quick notes. Um, the budget overall increased $1.9 uh, million or 3.8% driven largely off of the increase of the restoration of the 5% holdback from the state of Idaho. Um, we are not proposing a tuition increase or a tax increase this fiscal year and are, we are asking tonight for a motion to adopt the budget. With that, I'll stand for questions. Trustee Howard. Yes. Uh, Trustee Chair, I'd like to move um, that the board adopt the fiscal year 2022 budget as proposed. I'd second that. I have a, I have a motion. I have a second. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Any, any discussion on this budget? Uh, I do. <clears throat> Trust, Trustee McKenzie, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I was looking through and um, I was comparing basically 2012 numbers to 2021 numbers <coughs> and uh, it looked like the personnel count was uh, 30 people higher um, with and we've had quite a uh, significant student drop since then and um, well I would just like to meet more. I was hoping to discuss it at the budget workshop, but it wasn't ready then, um, to meet more and understand the locations of the personnel and, and the count in quantity. So personally, I, I'm not ready to uh, approve this budget uh, before understanding more of that. It, it does cause me concern. Um, now, I know we have new, I, I say, facilities like the children's uh, center and, and great initiatives and that's great but um, and I want to be clear it's completely separate than pay I know there's a pay approval uh, out th that we're considering and I, I, I fully support uh, uh, a pay increase and in, for the, the uh, considering the <coughs> but 
when it comes to quantity of um, physicians, that's that's where my concern is. Uh, do we want to? Should we get into the numbers now, or, or maybe if I meet with the president and VP Martin uh, during this next month, uh, that might just be best. Mr. Chair, Trustee Howard, yes. Um, I think one of the reasons why we've got this as a second meeting tonight is they have to be able to um, uh, publicize the tuition rates and the taxes and that sort of thing, and I'm not sure we've got another month to do that. But uh, in any event, uh, the comments that between 2012 and 2021, we've only increased the employment at the co college by 30 people is quite frankly to me um, pretty admirable because in that period of time we put on the Parker Center, uh, a whole new facility uh, with different programs. Um, we've also added buildings to the property and we've increased the nursing programs. Um, the fact that we've only got 30 additional uh, employees doesn't cause me concern, quite frankly. Um, but I think that for the purposes of making sure that we can move this budget along so that the college can do what it needs to do with regard to um, notifying people about taxes and tuition and costs and that sort of thing, I think we need to go ahead and um, deal with this <coughs> um, budget tonight. Can we may I propose an amendment that we do a, a partial approval of what you said, the things that need to be approved tonight? Well, I, th I think maybe a better way to do it would be to approve the budget. There's nothing that prohibits this board from going in later on and, you know, asking for a modification to the budget. We can do that. So if you can gather information that you think concerns you, you can bring it back to the board at a time where we amend the budget. But in the meantime, the full budget is moving forward and they can make commitments on contracts and that sort of thing that need to be done for the new school year. I, but there, so there, there is an avenue for you to, <coughs> I think, uh, cause some reconsideration to occur if you come up with information that you think necessitates that. I, I do have a couple of questions. Um, and, and, and I do want a clarification. Uh, and I'm not advocating that we don't approve the budget today, but I, but in deference to the question that Trustee McKenzie did ask, and he is a new trustee, and it's his first time through the budget process, and I'm not trying to contradict Trustee Howard, but I believe there have been times when we have approved the budget later than the May meeting in portions, and I think we've even been as late as August over the, at least the nine budget cycles I've been through. But there are certain ports I know we do have to have, and do have some regulatory requirements or time dates. I know for the property taxes, I, I think we have to communicate that if you can. The, the real so. key for us tonight is the tuition and fee setting is absolutely a must so that we can notify students for, for planning purposes. Okay. Um, we did do a continuing resolution last year in part um, with the board's blessing due to the dramatic uncertainty that we were facing last year. Certainly. Mr. Chairs. Cr oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Chris, I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor. We had the first reading on the 28th of April, and then we had our workshop on the 12th of May, and here we are on the 26th of May. And what I think would be helpful, um, and I, I probably, if I had thought of it sooner, I would have given you advance notice, so I apologize, don't mean to catch you flat-footed. But if you could, for the people watching, listening, for those in the community as we go through this budget process, and we have an iterative process, you guys work on it starting in the fall, and then we do it, and you have the individual interviews with the five trustees, usually in, in groups of two and one by themselves, and then we do the reading, and we do a workshop, we do the reading. Could you highlight, just from the first reading on the 28th of April, through where we are now, including, you know, the discussion at the first reading and, and at the workshop, kind of what we've done to change or modify this budget as it was proposed, to kind of highlight that effort a little bit. And for those that may have heard it at the first reading, what would be different now? Because we're not going through it slide by slide like we did the first time. And we've had the, we've had the ability to see it more in depth, you know, the opportunity to do that. So for most folks, they would have had the, uh, the time that we've had with this. And I think this would, would 
be insightful for them, enlighten them a little bit as to where we're going. And in particular, um, because we had the compensation study and then we had the, uh, the update that, uh, that Trustee Howard and, and, uh, and I had asked for it also, I uh, kind of seconded him. We have some particular components of this that um, impact our employees. So maybe we could highlight that just a little bit. Absolutely. Um, just, just briefly, there have been minimal changes between this, and I'll, I'm happy to point that out. Um, but to speak to the compensation study first, um, primarily the college is proposing a step increase for FY22 and implementing the salary study. Um, th that price tag came in at $428,535, um, and that substantially impacts uh, classified employees. Um, primarily through a 2% increase to those employees. And also, uh, there is a change on the faculty schedule that actually re eliminates the, the bottom two steps of the faculty salary schedule. And that's the substantive changes to um, the compensation study. The other piece of that is there are approximately 31 positions, and they are primarily all classified employees in our facilities, custodial, landscape areas that um, through this process we're found to be um, further off market than our other employee classes. And so there is an attempt to bring those closer to market. And that's the substantive change with the uh, salary study implementation. Looking at the changes between um, the readings. Trustee Bandage, if I could. Yes, yes. Uh, but to be, just to be clear, Chris, that's not a change from what was presented to the board in the uh, budget workshop? Correct. Okay. That's Correct. still the same information. S same information that was presented to the board at the workshop. At the workshop, but would have been in addition to what we had at the first reading. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, the, the other change that you'll see from the first, um, the first reading is several of the slides in meeting with Trustee McKenzie. He asked for additional data, so we added years to several of the, of the charts that, that you see. And then to speak specifically to Trustee McKenzie's request for the, the comparison of employees between um, FY 2012 and FY uh, 22. Um, just to, to briefly hit on this, this was a request and um, w was shared, I believe, after the, the workshop with the board. And to speak specifically to that request, um, I, I think the question that comes up, if I can address this briefly, Trustee McKenzie, in 2012, we had 382 employees um, funded through the general fund. And in this particular budget, 2022, we've got 397 employees who are reflected. Um, and so um, there's been a conversation about 30 employees, and I don't believe that's a 30 person difference on that. But would just share um, to Trustee Howard's point, the, the key pieces there, if you look at the changes in custodial and landscaping um, specifically, those were funded through the development of the occupancy costs for the Parker Center. And so several of the primary changes that you'll see in this are directly derived from increased facilities over that period of time. And so to Trustee Howard's point, you're absolutely correct. Those were funded by state dollars as part of the occupancy costs. And so that's why those, um, a, a large majority of those changes were, um, hesitate to use this word tonight, but it's the word that comes to mind, blessings from the state um, to support the facilities that the college has, um, and those were part of an appropriation. And that, those are the only changes that, that will be reflected between the first and the second reading. And Chris, uh, the number you were referencing was the 428,535, is that right? On that the is correct. Compensation? That is correct. Which we had seen at the board workshop. Correct. Which was kind of the hybrid proposal from what uh, the folks that had done our study from Evergreen, because they had given us some series of proposals to them, whether it was staff or faculty. And so just for clarification, it's been- You're absolutely correct. Uh, modified to hopefully meet our needs better. If correct. Chair Benucci? Yes. Just if I you. may clarify, uh, the 30 p count I uh, referenced has to do specifically with staff, and it goes from 220 to 249. And honestly, an increase doesn't necessarily concern me because we have, it's a children's center now that we have that's 12 employees, that's staff, and, and there's other categories uh, th that make sense. But we also have a third as many students, yet we have three more in the student services. 
and also institutional support. Uh, well, it, it's five down, which is this is okay. But it, and then and so also in this budget is the uh, initiatives, uh, strategic right. initiatives, which is asking right. for additional um, student. Uh, w w there's three categories in there. In, inside the, you're absolutely correct, Trustee McKenzie. Inside the strategic initiatives, there's three primary focuses. The first one is on recruitment and retention of students. And so really de devoting attention to our enrollment and supporting the work of the Strategic Enrollment Management Committee. The next one is support for the transition of the aerospace program to an apprenticeship model. So there's some work being done right now on that, and this just provides some funding for that that, that they may need as they make that transition. The third one is to support the Venture Center and what's happening in the Headland Building, specifically around some of the grants that we have uh, currently that will be, um, we'll be finishing those grants off. And so providing some, some gap support for those programs. So those are the three key pieces. There are not personnel within that strategic budget initiatives. It's all m and dollars. Mr. Chair. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, uh, Trustee. Who we got? Trustee Howard. I'm sorry. Um, Chris, could you um, explain maybe uh, just, just conceptually how a decrease in enrollment doesn't necessarily translate into a decrease in instructors? Um, what's the, what are the mechanics of that? A absolutely. So from a very high level, um, both on the instructional side and on the staffing side, um, Quite frankly, it takes a certain number of people to do a lot of these jobs, regardless of the number of students that we may be serving. And so um, I may call on my, my colleague, Dr. Burns, if she wants to speak specifically to instruction. But as an example, um, you know, we have um, 45 acres that we mow, whether we have 9,000 students or 5,000 students, we've got employees that, that are required to do that work. Financial aid is another good example. We're processing financial aid. Um, there's just a certain number of people we have to have regulatorily to separate the duties between those employees. So we'll need employees in those roles, whether we have um, 9,000 students or 5,000 students. From an instructional basis, um, and I'll, I'll defer to my colleague if she wants to, to chime in or correct on this, but offering our class schedule, and we've got students who are already on the pipeline. We wanna continue offering classes for them to be able to complete their degree and graduate. And so, um, Part of that is maintaining those instructors in those fields um, so that we, we can continue to offer those programs. The other piece I would just, just add to that is also, um, you've heard we're focusing on enrollment. We're focusing on recruitment and retention and trying to retain some of our very, very qualified faculty so that we can uh, continue to offer these programs when we do have enrollment. And so I see Dr. Burns leaning in, so I'll defer to her. Dr. Burns. Chair Banducci, Trustee Howard, uh, what Chris is sharing with you is, is absolutely accurate. Uh, when students come to North Idaho College to enroll in a program, it is our responsibility to ensure that they have the opportunity to complete that program. And so many programs, as you can see from the earlier years, you know, our programs were full, every seat was filled, particularly in 2012, 2013, and uh, it was great because uh, when you have full classes, it obviously um, helps in many, many ways. So as our enrollment decreased and we continue to offer programs, you know, if the enrollments drop below what we have the capacity to be able to serve in those classes, we can't stop offering just because the enrollments drop. So if a program normally, and I'm speaking about CTE right now, if a CTE program that normally enrolls 16 students drops down to eight, we can't not offer that program for that particular year simply because the enrollment has dropped for eight. So we can't eliminate the faculty who teach that. Over the years with our enrollment drop, how we have managed successfully um, the decrease in enrollment really has been through our adjunct faculty. We are able to decrease the number of adjunct faculty that serve us during peak times of enrollment. And then when we do not have the enrollment we, for our general education classes, we consolidate those courses as much as we possibly can. Um, Dr. Briggs will speak to this a little bit later on our agenda, um, but we consolidate um, those courses to the extent that we can, but we are obligated to offer our students um, certain courses in order for them to fulfill their program requirements and to be able to graduate in a timely manner. As you know, many of our programs are two-year programs, so once a student starts, 
we are obligated to make sure that they have the ability to complete those programs in a timely fashion. Uh, Dr. Burns, could you also talk about the programs we've added since 2012 and the impact that's had on faculty and staff? Thank you, um, Dr. McLennan, uh, just Chair Banducci. Since 2014, and I'm, let me pull the numbers up because I had, was just looking at them. I want to make sure. Um, so, since 2014, we have added approximately 20 new programs or certificates at North Idaho College. These are all um, primarily career and technical education programs, and that in alone has um, increased the number of our full-time faculty and staff by 12 to accommodate those programs. So as we add programs, you know, it requires not only the faculty to teach in those programs, but it also requires staff to support those programs. So um, again, it's a balance. When we lose, when we lose uh, enrollment, we can't completely stop offering the program just because the enrollment is decreased. And this is what happens. You know, we want to make sure that we maintain it's, it's a balance that uh, Chris was talking about. We want to make sure that during our times of low enrollment, we complete, com continue to offer a complete array of programs so that as we are doing the recruitment for these programs, students have a program that they are interested in to be able to come and enroll in. So if we immediately shut down every program that had a low enrollment, before you know it, we'd be really uh, de diminishing, diminishing our offerings to students, and they would be looking elsewhere. I have one more question, but you go ahead. Oh, oh go ahead. I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. Go ahead. Uh, did you have one too, Chair? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Just so I understand, the uh, <clears throat> the staff supporting those new certificates, I, w I would think that they would be located in like the academic instruction category. Yes. Chair Banducci, Trustee McKinsey, you are correct. Those staff would be associated. They would fall under the instructional arm of the budget. Would you describe the uh, academic support? Or, yeah, I don't think that necessarily concerns me so much because life changes, but the student services, like uh, what, what types of staff positions are in the student services? My turn. Chair Banducci, uh, Trustee McKenzie, uh, the, the various areas and departments that make that up are all the enrollment services, which include financial aid, admissions, um, registrar's office, advising, the TRIO program, residence hall, dining services, uh, children's center, campus security, athletics is now a part of that, uh, residence hall, the Student Wellness and Rec Center, so it, it's, it's quite a variety of different programs. Of those positions, I was trying to identify specifically where those, that, those three positions may have come in the last nine years. I don't know that I can identify exactly what those were. Um, we, pardon? Oh, uh, two dual credit ones in the student services side of that. Yes. That's right, to support the, the increase in dual, dual credit enrollment over that period of time, which was fairly dramatic. That, so, so a total that, of three over those nine years. That, that's in academic support. That, that's not in the dual, services. It is. It's listed as academic support. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. We can absolutely find those, uh, tell you what those three are. I don't know off the top of my head what three positions those were, but I'm happy to, to provide that information. Mr. Chair. I've been patiently waiting. You forgot about me. Uh, um, <laughs> That's all right. You don't I'm, feel good tonight. I'm not 100% here, so we'll, okay. we'll, we'll, my, my bad. Um, Go ahead, Chrissy. Well, I would just like to reiterate some of what you said, Mr. Chair, that we, we've had our one-on-one -on -one sessions with uh, Vice President Chris Martin and President McLennan over the budget. We have had first reading. We have had a word workshop. We've had tonight a second reading. So we've had a lot of time with this budget, of which is Congratulations to the team. There's, they're proposing no tax increase and no tuition increase. Those are the things I think our community very much needs to plan on. So I would encourage this board to pass the budget tonight. Trustee McKenzie um, asked good questions and he wants to be brought up to speed on college, uh, uh, I guess, operations and 
what personnel we have. He can do all of that one-on-one -on -one with Chris Martin or with Lita Burns, and we can move forward and pass this budget tonight. President McClendon. Thank you. Um, I also want to, and, and I know I'm going to say the word remind, understanding that two of our trustees um, can't be reminded because you, you weren't here for the discussion of this particular thing, but I, I think I brought it up a few times during our budget conversations, and that is um, at the beginning of the budget process last year, uh, I, inst I did, I instructed our budget development team to um, take a look at the structural implications of our staffing relative to enrollment in a longitudinal manner so that we would, we initially we projected out five years, we pulled that back to three years to look at um, budget decisions that we would be proposing last year, again in the wake of, if you call last year, uh, almost a reverse image of this year's uh, uh, financial uh, outlook in terms of funding. Uh, the the five percent. First, we had the, the two percent rescinding of budget, and then we had the five percent uh, pullback uh, of the decrease in the budget uh, coming into the current fiscal year. And so, it was really important to me and to to the other folks involved in this that we really make sure we're mapping out. And, and going to Dr. Burns' point, that balance of how do you how do you keep the infrastructure in place of what you really must create? Because these new programs that we're talking about, yes, they're responsive to enrollment demand, but they're equally responsive to industry demand and statewide goals around um, sectors of industry that need to be supported through workforce development. And so as we looked at that and, and did a pro forma on the uh, three-year uh, kind of how these decisions we would be making, uh, it, it allowed us to do some uh, tinkering in some cases and some very big moves in terms of our budget around staffing and personnel with the uh, early retirement buyout and the uh, essentially freezing positions, although we never said we were freezing positions, but uh, holding all positions and reevaluating them in the context of that three-year structural view. And uh, it's working. I, I think that was the right way to go because as we built the budget this year, we're able to now extend that out another year. Look at how, how close did what we projected line up with where we thought it would structurally, and we nailed it. And secondly, as we have more confidence now looking out three years, what we need to do. So the, I have a high level of confidence in, in the budget, both in that balancing act in terms of the right mix of staff, faculty to be able to do what we need to do, and that we're sound from a structural perspective moving forward that we're gonna be able uh, through the good, again, fiscal management uh, and, and staff and the team we have working through these things to manage this going forward with, I hope, relative difficulty, especially if we um, start to see the, let's turn the corner on the enrollment question. A, a big part of the program development is about relevance of what we do and how we serve the community, and we keep trying to dial that in and get it right, uh, you know, year after year after year. In, in the uh, hopes that, not the hopes, but in the idea that we're going to be meeting what the enrollment needs are for the community who would come to us. So I'll stop there. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I've got a couple of points, unless anybody else has anything, or a couple questions. And I know Dr. Briggs is going to talk to this a bit later, so I'm not trying to take a side here, but I know we're going to talk a little bit later about balancing the number of classes with the um, number of students, and we kind of alluded to that already. And we've added these new programs, as Dr. McLennan said, in response to some, um, some needs out there. Would, would it be fair to say that one of our reasons we have more, at least instructors potentially, for the amount of students we have is that we have more offerings, but each of the offerings just doesn't have as many students in each of them. Is that kind of where we're at, where we're getting a little bit lower class load? but we're adding some new programs, so we have more programs, more instructors, we need more support staff for that, but that's still in the context of a decline, a little bit of a declining enrollment, so it's kind of an interesting anomaly, if you will. More programs, more staff, but the number of students right now is, maybe that will switch, but it's kind of an interesting paradigm. Um, but I guess new offerings to get us more students, if we stuck 
truncated right here, we wouldn't get these new students, so it's, okay. Chairman um, Nucci, if, if I may, instruction has actually done a phenomenal job of managing overall our faculty numbers. I think we have some work to do on the staff side to be maybe as um, diligent as, as they've been, but I would also add, it's coming back to me now where those three people are at. There, there are some big changes happening in our society and we're trying to respond to those throughout the college. Certainly. And so some of those are also mental health counselors. <laughs> and so you know, there are things that we're doing to support students or need to do to, resport, to support students that they've said, hey, we need this support. Um, and so those are some things that are happening there on the staff side that again, um, we want to be very mindful of our staffing, but there are also new needs occurring um, throughout the college that we're trying to meet. Well, and we are also trying to do just more counseling in general, if I understood that, trying to plus that up a little bit, have more intentional contact with the students. And, and, you know, we've, we've had those conversations amongst all of us about the more touches we have, especially on the incoming freshmen, if they're 18 years old, it, it can make a big difference to their success. And, okay. Uh, just for everybody's edification, we drew remind everybody where we're going to house the new aerospace uh, Entrepreneurship, or the um, excuse me, the uh, apprenticeship program. So it is our intent to to work to house that at the Parker Technical Education Center, and so leveraging the instructional resources and the student services resources that already exist in that facility, that would be our, our hope as we work to develop that program. Okay. Mr. Chair, I, I don't mean to interrupt. No, you. go ahead. I have one more. Go, you go ahead. Well, go ahead with yours because I was going to call the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I had one more thing. This one may need you to come back to me. Uh, and this is not going to necessarily, it's not going to hold me up on the budget, but it, it's something I do have a question. And it's an area where I, I have an extreme interest, as many know. I'm still not, I'm still not satisfied that I understand the athletic budget. And uh, that's, been, that's been a concern of mine. And I, I like the fact that we went through this at the workshop and you gave me data from 2014 through the projected slash budgeted for 2022. And I've had some questions about, you know, the ramifications and the impact of both financial, seat time, all the rest of that from our transition from the SWAC to the NWAC with the majority of our sports. And as, as I look at our budget and I look at um, where we're at now and I see total, ex I'm just going to focus on the total expense side. Is that, that's a way to kind of look at it. Um, we were at 2.5 million in 14, about 2.2, 15, about 2.2 and 16, about 2.1 and 17, about 2.2 and 18, about 2.2 again in 19, all within, you know, round off air. And about 2.2 and 20, which, which was kind of a hybrid, funny year. And we had commitments and expenses. And of course, 2021 is a bit of an aberration, how that's gonna work. Now, on the and, and we, I came in at about, what, 1.2-ish. When I'm looking at the budget in 2022, I'm looking at about 1.5 and change. And I guess I'm, I'm curious at some point of where am I, where am I making a difference of about $700,000 in, in my expense side of what I'm doing? And, and where, where is that impacting my athletics? And where, where are, and where have we possibly not having as many opportunities to compete or I don't have the, as much staff, coaching, assistance, things like that. You know, the, the revenue side is, is, is a big unknown right now between the booster club and donations and what we get at the gate. You know, we charge a few bucks for wrestling and volleyball and basketball, you know, that sort of thing. I, I, don't, I don't think anything comes in for softball or soccer or, or, or golf or um, and, or cheer or whatever, that sort of stuff. Um, and if I could be wrong, but I think we have a few revenue sports and a few non-rev sports. Um, so so where, where, am I, where, am I, where am I losing $700,000 for my athletics? So Trustee Banducci, I am happy to, to work with Dr. Stanley and sit down and talk in full about the athletics budget. Um, I don't, I'm not prepared to do that tonight and go detail to detail tonight through the athletics budget. But there are some, some key things I would just point off off the top. We've made some significant changes over the past two years with the NWAC. Um, and some of those have to do with our grant and aid and how we are 
um, awarding grant and aid. And so I want to give Dr. Stanley credit for this. We all remember some tough times with the NWAC, and this is our final transition year of making sure that we are in alignment with how all the other colleges award their financial aid to their students for athletic scholarships. And so there's a piece of it that is there. Um, there are some other details in there, um, I believe, regarding some travel and, and some of our staffing. Um, but I, I would be happy to sit down and talk about that in detail with, with Dr. Stanley and, and whoever would. Is the net result, though, has been a reduction in grant and aid to our athletes? There's been a change in how we have done that. That's absolutely correct. To be in alignment with the NWAC regulations. And so part of what, what some of our challenges were over the years were how we were awarding grant and aid. And so this is our final year, uh, the year that we're in right now. Going forward, we'll be completely in alignment um, on a parity with how other colleges throughout the conference award their athletic grant aid. Even those in, in Oregon, because I had understood there were some discrepancies. Uh, well, Oregon is special, you're absolutely correct. You know, I'm happy to, to refer to Dr. Stanley if he wants to speak to the specifics. I mean, that seems not even, but maybe I missed that. Thank you, uh, Chair Banducci. There is a difference. Uh, at Oregon, because of their free college and some of the way they, they uh, uh, provide support for their in-state athletes. Washington is different through their system than, than uh, Idaho being, uh, uh, North Idaho College being the only one here. We've reduced in terms of grant and aid close to $400,000 over what we used to expend. Part of that is we can only award up to 65% toward the total cost of tuition and fees. We do have athletic work study, which is something that wasn't funded before under the NJCAA. We don't award for room and board, which we were able to do under NJCA. So that's accounted for um, a considerable difference in the amount of GIA. Also, the limit on the total number of awards under NJCAA, you could scholarship 15, for example, in basketball. In uh, the NWAC, you can scholarship up to eight. And so in all the programs, there's a reduced number of scholarships that you could give in each one of those programs with the exception of wrestling. That hasn't changed, as you know, as it's continued to be under NJCAA. So there's a considerable difference uh, in the amount that we're spending on GIA uh, to your question earlier. We're really glad to, and we've had conversations about this at a later date, present that information to the board, along with you've asked questions about travel and days missed and all of that stuff. We're working on that information and glad to present it in the future at the board's request. Okay, I appreciate that. Well, as I look at this budget, and if we're sound, I, I see things, uh, I've mentioned this previously, and I'm reading the local papers, I'm reading uh, the headlines, you know, one of the things that's sweeping the country right now, it seems, is, is women's wrestling. High school is being sanctioned throughout many, many states. And many, many colleges have picked it up. Uh, they have sanctioned tournaments now at the, at, the, uh, at the end of the season. Obviously, women's is an Olympic sport. So, I mean, for example, if we're working on, on advancing programs and adding it, to me, that's pretty low-hanging fruit. It seems like a women's wrestling program would be a natural Stuff like that. Well, before the Mr. question Chair? is called, I have one more question. What? Sorry, ahead, Chad. No, that's right. And that, that's all I have, but thank you. But I would look forward to the other additional information. If you have a question, tell me, Chair. Is Trustee McKenna. Sorry that this topic is lasting, which seems like an eternity. Um, is, is the salary study value amount, are each of the trustees content with the detail provided? Because uh, I feel like most of the times it's it's a final amount that's been presented, and I feel like it's been modified based off of the salary study, and I, I feel like the details um, haven't been and fully, at least, um, explained to me, at least. Chair, Ken, Chair Banducci, you, Trustee McKenzie. I can ask Ken. You seem to. I, I, I'm comfortable with the budget as presented, and that includes the resolution by the administration of how they should apply the salary study. Um, I suspect everybody can have questions about the salary study um, that was done, but I'm, I'm comfortable with the way it's been incorporated into the budget. Could, I would like to call a question. May I make one comment? <laughs> okay. I'm, I mean, uh, well, there's, there's a page from the Compensation study update, maybe at some point um, 
could elaborate on that for Trustee McKenzie as to the allocation of those percentages and those numbers to where we got to the 428,000 and change. Uh, Chair Banducci, Trustee McKenzie, um, our chief HR officer went, went through that at the the board workshop, and so I, I want to apologize because I may not be as versed as she may be on this topic. I wasn't going to have you do it now. Okay, not now. But happy to sit down again with Karen and and myself, and and if that's the will of the board, we can go through that again, or with Trustee McKenzie, happy to do that. All right, thank you. All right, um, Trustee Howard, you're calling for the question. I did, yes, sir. <laughs> thank you. So I'm going to call for a vote now. Yes, sir. We are uh, going to call for a vote for the approval of the. Proposed budget. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the chair also says aye. I believe that accounted for everybody. Anybody says nay? It passes five to zero. Thank, Thank you, you Chris. so much. The next uh, item on the agenda is under tab two in your board book. It's the third reading slash action for the revised leave without pay policy 3.04.06 and rescinding policies 3.04.06.01 and 3.04.07. And Karen Hubbard has that, act, that item. Uh, sure, Van I'm going to go ahead and take that one for Karen. Okay, uh, very good, Dr. McClellan. Her name is there. She's the one who brought this to the uh, board initially. As you recall, we had substantial discussion about that. Last month's board meeting, Trustee Barnes was uh, not able to be present for that discussion. Um, at, uh, at one point in the discussion, I indicated to the board that I would be bringing this policy back in the, in the form that it was uh, presented. Uh, without any without any changes, the only item of discussion for change was the uh, the approval uh, uh, resting with the administration and uh, some interest on the part of um, some board members to have that uh, decision making reside with the board of trustees, uh, either as a board as a whole or uh, as a delegated um, responsibility. To the board chair, um, I am um, bringing this policy back in, in the original form, uh, with the approval uh, intact, uh, residing with the administration, um, and um, I will leave that there. That's um, uh, bring back to the board uh, for approval. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chair, Trustee Howard. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve the revisions to policy 3.04.06 and approve the elimination of the policies 3.04.06.01 and 3.04.07. Second. Who is the second? Okay. I have a motion and a second. Do I have any discussion on this policy? Mr. Chair, we discussed yes. this at length last meeting and we went into the different um, concepts of, of where this policy belongs. And at the first reading, I was a little hesitant. I wasn't quite sure direction I wanted to go, but after listening to Karen Hubbard and certainly Trustee Howard made some good points, this clearly does fall into operations. Um, the trustees would really never have any role in determining that you leave without pay for an employee. We wouldn't be brought into their personal circumstances. It's just not really the purview of the board. It's an operational decision. So that swayed me that this belongs squarely under operations. And I'm good with the amendments. I'm sorry, what was, what was the last thing you said? And I'm, I'm good with all the amendments. I would just like to say. Uh, Trustee McKenzie, go ahead. Thank you. I would just like to say that 20 years ago when this policy was written or so, that other people thought it was just a good idea and uh, or a good idea to include board input and board oversight. And so the fact that nowadays people think it's good to 
not have any board input or board oversight in this one category, it, I would just like to state that I, I view that as everyone's welcome to their opinion. And um, well, from, from my reading and based off the policies and how I've seen communication and things enacted, I, I would just like to see uh, the board included in um, the policy draft. All right, thank you. It's, that, that's really the. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? You know, Chrissy, I, I've had some reservations about it too. And I'll confess, I still do though. I, I kind of put this in the same category as sabbaticals and, and, a, and a couple other things. And I think they, they rise at least to the interest of the board or at least to be aware of what's going on is just, I guess, an interesting broad definition of just oversight. And there are other things. So I, th I think I see where we're going to go here on the vote, which is fine. Uh, but I, I felt compelled to say that. Uh, there's still some things. Or I, I don't think it's an error to have the board involved. We are accountable. You know, I s opened up the newspaper the other day, and I see Chris Martin's face, and I see front of page above the fold, and I see another one. And I had no idea that article was going to be a paper that day. I see another article prior to that that says, we've we got this agreement with the city of Coeur d'Alene and we're going to use our parking lot and they're going to fill the potholes and make that good and they're going to use that for parking this summer. I had no idea that article was going to be in the newspaper. There's a point where if we're an elected board and we're to have oversight of this institution, A, we have to know what's going on and B, we need to be engaged and have some interaction on this. And, and equally important, Anything that's newsworthy for the public, if, if I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to see it in my newspaper or see it on my email or see it on my phone, I want to know about it. So, and, and some of these other things, you may not think they're newsworthy, but people are watching and people note those things. And when times are tough, and, and I, I'll use sabbaticals as an example, some people have differing opinions of whether those are appropriate or not at a community college. But people do notice they're going on, and if enrollment's down, and depending on the budget, and a lot of in education institutions got bailed out this year with a lot of CARES money. Schools didn't have to run the buses, and there was lots of things. So it was an interesting year from, from a money standpoint, a lot of federal money. But they still look at it as, are these appropriate expenditures? And so they are watching all these things, and, and, and they will hold us accountable as the elected officials. So, uh, Mr. Chair. There's my thought. Not Mr. Chair, done. could I have one more comment? Certainly. Thank you. Well, I think, I think, Mr. Chair, you've kind of commingled a few things there. And as far as being aware of what's on the front page, I would agree with you. We, we, it's good, always good to know that. I, I do think our information officer has had an awful lot on her plate lately and hasn't been able to keep up with a lot that maybe you'd like to see. But it's a little bit totally different argument than this policy. This policy is clearly about operations and would the board ever individually or as a group decide on a leave without pay issue with an employee and no we wouldn't um, as far as the agreement with the city I will say that I first saw it when I went to my council meeting and um, I, I was pleased that we have such a good relationship we continue with the city working well, I'm together. not saying it's good or bad yeah I'm yeah just... but um, but uh, it would be good to know in advance sometimes, and it's going to be hard, though, to push out every single little operational decision that somebody makes, because that is clearly an operational decision on whether we use a parking lot for parking, and that's not going to come to the Board of Trustees. So I would just say try to delineate between policy that works in front of us and other ideas about communication. President McClendon. Uh, thank you. I, you know, I, I I didn't even know the article was going to be in the paper on the, this guy over here, but um, it was good news. And um, you know what I, you know I don't uh, I don't always get it right because I don't always know what's coming. Sometimes uh, the media surprises even me a little bit. Um, but if it's and you will recall, I recently sent you a communication over the weekend that I thought there would be uh, something in the newspaper that might have an adverse impact on the college or the perception of the community of the college and I wanted to make sure the board was aware of the potential of that uh, article being there. I had no input into the article. I wasn't interviewed for the article. Uh, I just knew that it was potentially going to be there and I gave the board a heads up on that. And that's a commitment that I'll continue to do. I don't think I'll always be able or ready to uh, forward 
kind of the good news uh, to the board. Um, I, I suppose I could try to do that or have uh, our communications department do a little bit more on that. Uh, but certainly if there's something that's going to ride to the board uh, uh, concern uh, and input from the community about something adverse or potentially negative impact in the institution, I do my best uh, to, to get that information to the board uh, before it becomes public, and I'll continue to do so. Well, on that note then, I appreciate that, but then we'll note the caution then. One. Talking about what the budget's going to look like and what we're doing, and we're not going to have taxes or property tax increase and or tuition increases and all the rest of that, until we've actually signed off and approved the budget as a board, maybe that conversation can wait with, with the media so that we have a, it kind of puts us in an interesting spot when it's already been out there and this has said what we're going to do and then we haven't voted on it yet. Mr. Chair, point of information. Yes. Um, is all this discussion pertinent to whether or not we're going to vote past this? You know, at this point, uh, Michael, I'm not quite sure. We've kind of gone a couple different all ways. Questions. If I can stuff. go back to... Uh, we can, we can. Well, uh, it's all right. We, we're gonna, we're gonna take the vote. Question's been called. That's fine. Um, all those in favor of approving the new revised leave without pay policy 3.04.06 and rescind policies 3.04.06.01 and 3.04.07, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Nay. I vote nay. Motion carries three to two. Policy is approved. Next item on the agenda is an information action item. It's the board conduct policy. It is Trustees Barnes and Howard. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, sir. Um, the board has recognized um, the concern by the college faculty and staff that, as they've expressed in the past in their uh, letters to the board. And um, part of that concern was um, the rescission of policy 2.01.10 in November. And we've listened to the concerns of the faculty and staff and constituents of NIC. And we're gonna offer the readoption or I'm going to offer the readoption of 2.01.10 with some amendments. And the amendments um, are, uh, the only amendment is under the paragraph entitled Interaction with College Personnel Guidelines. And the amendment is the inclusion of the following language. Board members should be afforded confidential communication with, NIC, with the NIC community and nothing herein shall be construed to prohibit or discourage communications between board members and members of the faculty, staff, administration, or community. So Mr. Chair, I would um, make a motion to adopt uh, policy 2.01.10 with those amendments. All right, thank you. Do I have a second? I have a second. All right, I have a motion and I have a second. Do I have any discussion? Mr. I would like to add my comment, Mr. Chair. Please, Trustee Barnes. Uh, we all recognize that uh, there was a lot of uh, contention with uh, uh, this policy late last year. And um, we are all in agreement that uh, a lot of work needs to be done and we are committing to address our differences in this uh, very rapidly. So while we're voting to do this, we also recognize that there is much work to be done to perfect this policy that affects primarily the board members. And um, just to note for those that you and uh, Trustee Howard have uh, agreed to continue to work on that? Yes, yes sir. All right. Thank you, appreciate that, both the gentlemen volunteering to do that. Is there any other uh, comment on this just a question to clarify trustee mckenzie in the future with this policy as written if there is a tie vote will that decision pass or fail i believe it would fail like the prior uh board uh session is everyone in agreement on that i don't know i and i don't know that we have to answer that until it happens 
If I may, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, yes, Mark, please. A, a tie vote does not pass the motion. So, and I, I and I think really that the situation that you you uh, it's a bridge that you cross when you need to. Thank you, Mr. Lyons. Answer the question. I'm, I'm content. Yeah. All right. All right. I have a motion. I have a second. It doesn't appear that we have any additional comment. All those in favor of reinstituting the uh, board conduct policy as revised, uh, please say aye. 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 All right, we have, uh, anybody nay? Nope. We have five ayes. The motion passes five to zero. It is approved. The next item on the agenda is tab three. It is the adoption of resolution to reserve foregone taxes. And Vice President Martin will speak to that. Chair Baducci, members of the board, um, you, you are aware there's been significant changes to the Idaho tax code over the last two legislative sessions. I come before you this evening um, requesting to reserve um, the 3% that we did not take this year into our foregone bucket. Um, there are substantial changes made to the statute during this current legislative session, which dramatically limits um, our usage of that compared to the past, but wanted to come forward tonight um, to request the reservation of the $511,000 if that is the will of the board. Mr. Chair. Trustee Wood. I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution to reserve foregone taxes for FY 2022. Second. I have a motion and I have a second. Uh, do we have discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could. Go ahead. Uh, I will, this is fairly familiar to me. The city had to go through the same motions. It's really um, something we're forced to do. If we don't adopt this, then we give up the ability to ever go back and recover it. Now this college hasn't recovered any foregone in I think since about 2004. So it's really rare that we would do that, but you never know what the future holds. And so I think we have to protect our ability to do that. It's a fiscally responsible thing to do. Chris, could, could you do something for all of us? Could you give us a brief tutorial on what that legislation did to all the prior foregone taxes that we had banked and then what that looks like going forward with foregone taxes and to the point of you're right there are some limited applications that we can use those taxes or, or go get them. Chair Banducci, members of the board, I will share I am still learning uh, the changes in this statute so I will ask Mr. Lyons if I if I have a issue here he'll correct that but um, in, in general, um, the college does have foregone taxes. And this legislation didn't change the amount of foregone taxes that we have banked, if you will, on the books. And how, how much approximately? Um, you know? let me if, if you don't, that's okay. But I think it's a pretty substantial amount. It, it is it? a substantial amount. And it is, I believe, over $3 million that is currently banked in, in foregone. Okay. $3,341,527 is currently in our foregone accounts. Came up with that pretty good. Okay. It is in, it's in the budget, so it's there. Yes, yes. Um, substantially, this, this new legislation, what it does is it limits the amount we could take um, each year as part of our foregone. So the overall uh, legislation limits the amount we can increase our budget by 8%. So we could do that through new property. We can do that through uh, taking the 3%, but we could also leverage foregone taxes, but we couldn't leverage more than that 8% cap. So that's one substantial change to the foregone. The other piece that's fairly substantial is if you take foregone for capital improvement projects, you can take it for the project. When the project is complete, that, is, that goes back into your foregone account. And so it, it isn't something that you would just keep on, on the books forever, much like we did for the last capital improvement project, We've kept that as part of our ongoing capital planning for the capital reserve. This legislation would, would actually limit our ability to do that in the future. So those are the two primary changes I would just note is it, it impacts the use of foregone for capital, but it also limits the amount of foregone you could take because that's part of that 8% calculation for uh, general operations. 
Hasn't new construction slash new growth accounted for a significant portion of that 8% the last couple of years? Or would it going forward? It, it will going forward, right absolutely now? for sure. So for NIC, um, our new property on the rolls is, is it has generally been equal to if we took the 3%. And so that's, that's part of that going forward. The new, new property in the rows absolutely counts towards that 8% increase. Okay. Mr. Chair. Trustee Howard. Uh, Chris, again, my recollection of this may be faulty, uh, but I'm sure yours is better. Um, but would you explain um, our history in terms of how we, um, how well we, we manage our um, stewardship of the, the taxes uh, in terms of taking um, the, uh, what we're allowed each year and not taking it, leaving it in the bank for the taxpayers to keep, um, and how we stand with regard to other agencies <coughs> in, in the state in terms of our stewardship of this responsibility of um, having the opportunity to take the taxes but, but reserving it to important situations. Absolutely. Um, Trustee Howard, members of the board, NIC has a substantial foregone bank, which is unique specifically among community colleges, but also unique among many taxing districts within Kootenai County. The board has the authority to take up to that 3% every single year. Um, I think with the legislative change, we could probably take uh, a little bit more there towards that 8%. But the point being, the board does not typically take the 3%. It has been rather rare that we've taken that 3% increase every single year. And that's, again, a direction of the board. Um, within the budget this year, we did provide um, what we hoped would be a educational tool, not only for the board, but also for the public, to look at the stewardship the board has had towards taking the 3%. Um, and so as we kind of look back over the past several years, um, we took a tax increase, a partial tax increase of the 3% in 2017. And we took partial tax increase in 2019. We took the 3% in 2020. Um, and that's just looking back over the last several years. The board generally has been very judicious in taking that foregone amount. So judicious, in fact, that I get a phone call from the State Tax Commission every single year asking if NIC is going to take foregone because it changes the overall state calculation of taxation. If NIC touches their foregone, we have that large a pool of foregone taxes. And so, um, in general, the board doesn't take the full 3% every year. And in fact, um, in the last eight years, I believe we've taken the full 3% one time. And, and oh. Let me just follow up on that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, how do we compare to other agencies, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, taking the 3% statewide, just if you know. Uh, we are in the minority in that we do not take our full 3% every single year. So especially within the community college area, all the community colleges generally take their full 3% every single year. Um, and then locally, um, many of our taxing districts take their full opportunity to take their 3% and budget that every year. That has not been the practice at North Idaho College. Thank you. Trustee McKinnon. Uh, a green trustee question, but if I think I'm in support of, of sending this uh, taxes to foregone, but let's say next year we magically want to call the foregone taxes. I think we're sending, uh, what's the number that we're sending to foregone taxes? Just uh, under approximately $500,000. Yeah, $500,000. Next year, so we could um, acquire those five $500,000, but, but that's like a, a one-time tax, or is it basically act like we, is it like a yearly thing? So to, if we take it for general operations, um, we can only take up to an 8% increase given the new legislation that passed this year. So prior to this year, we could have taken the full $3 million at any one time. That is not possible now. So it goes into the overall calculation of you can only take up to that 8%. If you do it for general operations, you can, um, once you levy that, that take that full 8%, it would be ongoing every year. If the board was to take foregone taxes for a capital project, the board could take foregone taxes, again, I believe up to that 8% increase, but it would only be for that life of that project. And when that project was completely built, it would go back into your foregone bucket and reduce the overall taxation levy for the district. 
money would or the taxation amount? Both, both would. So we would reduce our levy by the, the same cost of the foregone increase for capital. We would take that off the rolls, and so it would actually re reduce the overall tax burden to taxpayers. The levy would reduce by the amount that expires on the capital portion of the use of foregone. I think, to clarify me, I think it's page 6 of 30. Could, um, let's just pretend like yep. next year we're going to take the full 8% of foregone taxes. Could could the t levy rate and um, could that get updated as if we were going to just, just like just help me understand the foregone uh, Absolutely. Taxes? So does that make um, sense? it does make sense. And I think that's a great point. If it's okay, let me just pull this up so we can all see it. Sorry to make the meeting longer. Trustee McKenzie, I think one thing just to share tonight, um, you're not alone. This is, um, it's actually all new to everyone this year because of the way the legislation changed. You're my hand. I apologize, I already shut the budget down. So, what's that? It's 18 of 50 if you're on the board book, there it is. So, to Trustee McKenzie's point, um, if we look at the FY21, excuse me, FY22, and then look at FY21 here, um, if we were to increase our, our levy amount this year and take a percentage of foregone taxes, that levy amount that you see there, the total budgeted levy of $17.3 million, just for kicks, we'll take the $500,000 this year, that would change that amount to $17.8 million in our budget levy if we were to take $500,000 of foregone taxes. To your point, that would increase the overall levy for North Idaho College, and it would also increase the impact of taxpayers because the levy amount would increase based on us increasing our overall levy. So the overall levy that you see there, that $17.3 million, that would be impacted by foregone. So if the board chose to take foregone in any amount, you would see it on that 17.3 line. We would divide whatever that levy amount is the county would, by the total valuation of Kootenai County, which happens to be $22.6 billion this year, that's what creates that levy rate amount that is actually what we charge taxpayers. And it would be a one-time yearly change versus, and wouldn't change like FY19 since we've gone fo forward on taxes? It wouldn't go backwards, it would just go forward. Okay. And so if we did that next year's levy amount, it, assuming we take the, the, the $500,000 this year, next year's starting levy amount would be $17.8 million plus new property on the rolls and anything the board chose to take. Thank you. So it would go on in perpetuity unless it was for capital use. Excellent. I understand. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Trustee Howard. I'd like to make a motion uh, that we adopt a resolution to reserve the foregone taxes for fiscal year 2022. Mr. Chair, I made that motion. You, yeah, we have the motion, sir. No, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Here, no. Here, the second question. Actually, I would like to comment. Um, you okay? All right. I did. did you, okay. For me, I've been waiting. Um, just a thought. Uh, I'm looking at where we're at with <coughs> current valuations in Kootenai County and, and what that's doing to the property tax rolls. I'm looking at the bond that we just passed for the firefighters, which is a good thing. I'm looking at the three levies that have passed for the, each of the major school districts. I'm looking at <coughs> history and, and, and some of the history we've even had here on this campus regarding foregone taxes and the mill site and all the rest of that. And I look at the bank that we have right now with foregone taxes and I look at our ability to go 8% anyway. Um, the new growth that's continuing doesn't seem to be abating anytime soon. We have the automatic 3% every year. I would suggest that we don't need to bank this right now and if just for the optics and, and for the PR, I, I, I think we should not do this resolution. I, I think we could go ahead and let this one go at this time and I think we'd still be extremely healthy and this would be a very small bump in the road. Uh, that's just my opinion. I share with the other trustees, but for your consideration, I, uh, I, I don't think we need to uh, reserve these foregone taxes with everything else 
at the 10,000 foot view looking at the whole mosaic. I think this is a very small part of it. I think that would be a, a statement that we would continue our good stewardship. But to Chris's point, we took a couple fractional increases in the full 3% last year. Um, so that's just my statement. I'm sharing my comment. Are there any other comments um, on this? Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. I, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I don't think that it's fiscally responsible. I think moving forward, we always have to protect the college against the unknown. We haven't taken foregone, I think since 2005 or 2006, we've been very, very judicious and diligent and careful with our taxpayers. But we can't do things just because of optics or it makes people feel good. We always have to be planning for the future. And uh, planning for the future means that we bank this. And if we ever are in a position, God hope we're not. But if we are, we would have to go back and retrieve it. I appreciate that. I do feel the need to respond to that, though, as a registered investment advisor and a fiduciary and a guy with an economics degree. I, I do look at everything by the numbers also. My feelings don't ever overcome me when it comes to money and taxes. So I do want to take into account our fiscal position, and I, I believe I did. I, I gave some other reasons why I, I have my position. But at the core of it, I think financially we are in a position that we don't need these foregone taxes. So I, I am looking at it in that perspective as a person that manages finances every day for clients, and, and, and uh, that's my language. Mr. Chair, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I, I, you know, I, with the changes in the law, um, with the eight uh, percent limit, if we uh, if we ever did get to a point in ter terms of some of our capital planning and our capital discussions, eight percent of a higher number is going to serve the college much better than 8% of a lower number. And the good thing about that, if I understand it correctly, is that once we work our way through that, that 8% sort of shift into um, capital goes back into foregone, so it's not a permanent hit to the taxpayers, but it does provide us with more financial leverage for a capital project. So. Uh, you know, if, if only for that, I would, I would really advocate for putting these, going ahead and, and passing resolution so that we have access to that. Because it, when, now that it's limited at 8%, that really does limit uh, access to the full amount of the fund. So, something to think about. Mr. Chair. Christy Howard. Um, there have been discussions in the past. Um, not just necessarily on this board, but uh, amongst other board members of other um, governmental entities, that, that why not just take the three percent every year? Why put it? Why put it in the foregone taxes? Just take it now, and you've got it. Nobody's going to question it later on. You've got it. Our philosophy has been: no, the taxpayers are entitled to keep this in their pocket if we don't need it right now, and when we do need it then it's there for us to use in a judicious manner. And I think we've experienced and, and illustrated a, a strong stewardship of our responsibilities in not taking foregone taxes except in extreme circumstances. And this is something to protect NIC um, and also to protect the public uh, by not taking um, the, 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 uh, the allowable 3% every year. I mean, that would be an alternative, quite frankly, to take the 3% and put it in a capital account, and then you could do whatever you wanted to do with it. I think what we're doing by just reserving it is a responsible thing to do with regard to the taxpayers of this county. Thank you. Can I call a question? Certainly, sir. Okay, call the question. The question has been called. We will take a vote on the action. Adoption of resolution to reserve foregone taxes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. 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 I will add my nay to that. It does not pass. Defeated three to two. The next item on the agenda is with uh, President McLennan. It's the first reading slash action for the Board of Trustees meeting calendar for the years 2021 through 2022. <clears throat> President McLennan, please. Uh, 
uh, each year we provide the board with a proposed <coughs> uh, meeting calendar. Uh, you have that in your packet under tab four. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd make a motion to adopt the calendar as presented. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Um, I would second it if we can get an amendment that we forego the second reading in June. I would make that amendment. But, um, I'd like to give everybody at least a moment, if that's okay, to sure. take a look at the dates. I think we've had our board vote, but I just want to make sure everybody's had that opportunity. I know we've made a couple of accommodations in August and in November and December, um, or a little bit of a different day. So I just want to make sure everybody noted that, and if anybody needed to take a quick glance at the calendar just to make sure. Just to be clear, is this approving that we're not going to have a July meeting, or has that already been approved from last year's? Uh, oh, that's a good question. That's the norm, Mr. Chair. We generally do not meet in July. No, no, no I, I know that. Yeah. No, I mean, with the question, I, doesn't I don't know the answer to that. It doesn't preclude you from having a July meeting. It's just this is the schedule that we would publish. Uh, okay. Uh, typically, the board is... Taking Sorry. the month of July off and having a board meeting. No. Yeah, we're not really following a, a calendar or fiscal year the way we kind of do this. So, Our, okay. So we have a motion, and then we have a conditional second, but with an uh, an amendment. I think she amended it. I did. You okay? Did, would you um? Do we want to do an amendment or just retract the initial motion and just make it? I'll just withdraw my original motion and okay. restate it. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Rick, did you have a, a uh, No, I, well, I was just going to say that we put this on the agenda as, an infer, or as a first reading action to provide for action being able to be taken if the board desires to do that. Oh, thank you, Rick. That clarifies. I don't need to amend my motion. We can take action. So it's just a first reading. It's a first reading. Well, but it's an action item, and the action that I've made a motion on is to adopt it. It can be either. It can be a first reading if you choose it to be, and we'll bring it back again next meeting. Okay. Or so it can you can the board can choose to take action on it tonight. It's really the board's preference. Okay, so we don't need to. Okay, we don't, we don't need to uh, suspend the second reading then. Yeah. Is my parliamentarian on, on board with that? Uh, yes, you, you could do either. It's, it's okay. optional. If you want to uh, pass this now, you you you, will, you, you can do that. Uh, if you want to hold it over to the next meeting, you can do that as well. Right now, there's a motion, and there's no been no second. So, if there's no second, then we don't go forward with it this month. Is there a timeline where we need to do this now versus doing it in June? Would this allow people a chance to just review their calendars? I, I don't know if everybody's had that opportunity. I don't. So it's just a first reading. Then. Okay, why don't we just call it a first reading? We'll okay take that. That gives everybody a chance just to check, and maybe, you know, in another month we'll have a little better feel for our calendars, uh, looking outward a little bit. But this will give us something to work with, and we can see it. Okay. And Christy, I hate to do this. Mm -hmm. Did, just did I hear you say I'll, you, just, re you I'll with, just retract my motion. That's what I thought I heard you say. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, Next item, and I know it says uh, Dr. Burns, but I think we're going to hear from Dr. Briggs. <laughs> oh, I should start all over. <laughs> for, for our viewing audience, I will start all over. Chair Banducci, members of the board, 
um, it certainly is our uh, pleasure from instruction to be able to provide for you information about how we do course scheduling and how we modify that uh, scheduling as it occurs throughout while well, students are registering and sometime even at the beginning of the semester. Um, this question I think came from a board member. I, I want to say it was Trustee Barnes asked us this question uh, very early on and uh, because of the heavy agendas that the board has had we were not able to present it. So although it might seem um, not as timely as it was when we, it was, the question was originally asked, actually um, I think it's very timely because we are in a registration process now anticipating enrollment in the fall and certainly we'll be looking at um, making adjustments to the, the course schedule as we move forward. So with that I would like to welcome um, Dr. Larry Briggs up. Uh, he's the Dean of General Studies and he is going to present this information to you. Thank you. And not to steal any of Dr. Briggs's thunder but this is going to be the last time we're going to probably have him in front of us in any capacity. I think he's off into the sunset as they say hopefully enjoying retirement. Chair Benducci, members of the, uh, of the board, um, colleagues, thanks very much for uh, this opportunity to talk about uh, scheduling. I'm gonna give a high level overview. I happen to be the spokesperson. We could pick people all across this campus because anytime we talk about scheduling, we are talking about something that requires everybody on campus to be involved. So it is collaborative in all ways. IT's involved, the registrar's involved, instruction's involved, facilities are involved. So we have everybody on deck, marketing and communications. So that's a, that's a key element of whenever we put together a schedule at the, at the institution. We pay a great deal of attention to the sequence. We've got to be sure that we are providing students with the courses they need for prerequisites to progress and to make sure that they can complete. This is a deliberate process as well. There are between 2,300 and 2,600 individual sections fall and spring that the college offers. And we offer those sections in multiple locations. We're at Parker, we're, we're dual credit. We're of course here on campus. We've got clinical settings. So there are a lot of place elements that are involved in the, in the schedule. Timing of a course is critical, and then how are you delivering your instruction? Is it in person? Is it hybrid? Is it, is it through online? So all of those variables come into play, and we've got to have checks and balances. We have a lot of people who have their eyes on this to try to get it as right and as accurate and as effective as possible. And of course, this is an iterative process. We know there is no such thing as a perfect schedule. We try and we're able to make progress because we have so many people contributing and then we have that prior fall really to be the model of what is going to come in the next fall. We don't do it in a lockstep fashion but we rely very heavily on all the time, effort and energy that goes into building that schedule. So those, these are four themes that I'm gonna talk a little bit about as I get into a few of the details without getting too much into the detail about all the nuance related to uh, scheduling and, and what's, what's involved. So here's the cycle. Students are at the center, of course. We have a calendar that the registrar gives us. We need to be sure that we are working on this in a fashion that, that provides students with the opportunity in a sequence to be able to register and get the courses that they need. So we initiate that process, and again, we're looking at all of these factors around number of seats, the timing of those seats, how we're delivering it, where we're delivering it. We're able to use a set of resources that are provided by our institutional effectiveness office. We have those reports to make sure that we're doing the best job we possibly can in initiating that scheduling process. Registrar helps make sure that we do that in a way that, again, we've got that time built in to do the work necessary. We then revise the schedule and let me give you a couple examples. These aren't going to surprise you at all. If we look, for instance, at the total number of sections that the college offered, fall of 20 and spring of 21, it's 14% fewer sections than on average in the prior five years. Our enrollment has changed. 
And so we have actively modified the total number of seats available at the institution as a result of that. The other huge factor, of course, is the pandemic. All of the work that was done in the last year to make modifications around how we are delivering our instruction in a way to help ensure safety, we had all kinds of people on campus pitch in and help make that possible. Let me give you a, a couple specifics to help describe that in some detail. So in the fall of 20, about three out of four of all of our sections had some form of in-person component to it, whether it was indeed that direct in-person, totally face-to-face, -face, or if it was hybrid, where there was a combination of some opportunity for in-person involvement and then use of online delivery. And about 25% that was wholly online. So that was the profile in the fall of 20. If we look at what our plans are for the fall of 21, because we have the schedule built and it's out there, three quarters of all of our classes have some face-to-face -face component to it. About 25% is online. The huge difference is we have changed the sections that are hybrid very dramatically. So last fall, we had 485 sections that were hybrid. This fall, we only have 152, and that means that our face-to-face -face has grown considerably because students and faculty want to have more of that face-to-face -face interaction. So those are the kinds of shifts that we have put in place as we're looking at a schedule revision from last fall to this fall. Certainly a component to that schedule revision has to do with the change in faculty. Every year we have change in faculty for a variety of reasons. One of the things that we're spoken to tonight in the budget is the fact that we did an intentional buyout of faculty. So I can think of three areas that I happen to have a chance to work with where they did not have full-time faculty this year that they had in the prior year. So math didn't have, music didn't have, psychology didn't have, long-time tenured faculty to work with to put together the schedule. So they had to make adjustments around that. So all of that is in those kind of first two globes in this little cycle that we have, that we have here. We make that work happen, it then gets into a proofing stage. And again, lots of moving parts. So we have colleagues in student services help our administrative staff at the division level, at the instructional level, make sure that it's right. Maybe we missed something around the contact time for credit hours. We gotta be sure that's dialed in. We got a lot of different ways we deliver instruction that can get a little tricky. This past year, we had a great deal of work that we did thanks to IT, thanks to facilities, to make sure we were hitting those room caps appropriately. And if we were using a lot of hybrid delivery or online delivery, did we have the equipment in those classes so you weren't sending someone to a class that didn't have the wherewithal to make that, cl that class successful? Again, a tremendous amount of work that's been done in the past year. So we had a successful and effective schedule and were able to post that and put it, up, put it out there and then open registration. So we're most of the way around the circle, if you will. The fall, 21 schedule opened on April 12th. The priority, of course, was for a continuing student to have first opportunity to enroll in classes. The first opportunity to be advised because those students generally have a good sense of what it is they want to take. We want them to get those classes first and then new students will follow and then we'll do a lot of work over the, over the summer in particular and as we come into fall with new students to get them advised and to have them be able to select classes. As I said earlier, uh, this is never a perfect process. As much as we've got a lot of eyes and a lot of experience, um, we have tools that assist us because maybe we made a call that was off the mark. Maybe we have too many sections in an area. Maybe we don't have enough sections in, the air, in, in a particular area or in a particular discipline. Reports are generated on a weekly basis. Those are very actively consumed by decision makers at the division level to make sure that we're able to have those adjustments made throughout the time that the schedule is up. So for instance, I had two changes just that were made today, 
both of which were associated with dual credit classes. We had dual credit offerings. They had more interest. We added a section, for instance. So it is a dynamic process even after we have opened the, the schedule and uh, we're, making, we're making some changes. Um, I, I'd, like, I'd like after this very high level summary and, and some of the steps that we, that we take, um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time, and this is the last slide, so I really tried to be succinct this evening, is to talk a little bit about canceling classes. And, and let, me, let me give you a little context. When we cancel classes, and I look at the spring 21 cancellations at the institution, the majority of those cancellations were in sections that had zero enrollment, 60%. Now that is in part by design. So for instance, music and physical education are overrepresented in those cancellations with zero enrollment. The reason for that is we have an array of adjunct instructors in music who might, there might be harp, there might be guitar, it might be trombone. Any given year, they know that if they're willing, we're going to put that class out there. But if we don't have anyone register, we're going to take that class down. That, that happens in music commonly. In PE, there's a similar kind of approach, way of thinking, and that is, let's put a lot of activities out there, let's see what happens to be of interest to folks. And if we're finding that the, that the registration is not at the level we need, we'll cancel those classes. So again, when you see the cancellation numbers in some of these reports, the vast majority of these cases, there's not a single student or maybe one or two students in those, in those classes. A couple other um, kind of data points uh, for you in um, understanding uh, what it's been like at the college pre-COVID. On average, for the three semesters before we came into COVID, 7.5% of all offered sections needed to be canceled. So specifically, we're talking about almost 4,700 sections, and we canceled a little over 350. So not bad overall in terms of our ability to right size what our offerings are and then adjust our changes as we need to in a, in a dynamic way. So that said, let me give you a couple concrete examples of when we do need to make some hard decisions about do you run a class or not run a class. And so this, this uh, kind of decision tree uh, I, I think captures it fairly well. We always ask, what is the impact on the student? If we cancel this class, is this going to harm the student's ability to accomplish what she is trying to accomplish? I'll give you an example. Chris Martin is teaching accounting. Larry Briggs is teaching accounting. No one's surprised that a lot more people are going to register for Chris Martin's section than they're going to register for my section. But because we know that there are a number of students who want accounting, Chris's section and my section is at the same time. So they're going to take the two or three students from my section, they're going to put them in Chris's section where he's got space, they're going to cancel my section. Student might have a difference in instructor, but in all other respects the class is entirely the same. Those are the kinds of things that we are able to do commonly because division chairs are in communication with students through advising to make those arrangements possible. So that's part of the decision tree where we say, are there alternatives to schedule delivery? If there are, great. We move that student into that other section. Now what if there's not that ideal class? And we also know that it won't harm that student to do an alternative class. I'll pick PE. Maybe I register for a dance class. I really would love to take that class. We don't have the enrollment. But we have four or five or six other classes also in PE meet the same requirement. The student can fit it on her schedule. We'll make that change. So that's the alternative portion of this decision tree. 
And again, we will make sure that we communicate with students so that they're aware of what we're doing, they know how to do it, and uh, there, there's not, they're not left uh, without clear and effective <coughs> dialogue about what's happening. There are situations where we have to make more difficult decisions. So for instance, if there is a class that we're really saying we don't have the enrollment to run it, we really come down to two decision points. And so this is under the, under the blue, will course cancellation harm students' completion? And if the answer is yes, we tend to go in two directions. One is this idea of a directed study. It's basically individualized instruction with the same faculty member with that student through an agreement that goes through a formal process, it's signed off, and that student is still able to get that class working with that faculty member, but we cancel the section that was associated with it. Faculty are paid at a dramatically reduced rate for that instruction. It ends up being a win-win. Student gets the course, the faculty member is able to engage the student in an area that's important to the student and important to the faculty member, the institution does not pay what they would otherwise pay to run that section. Uh, for instance, a student is doing a Spanish series. Last course in the series, student needs that class. This is a course that our modern language faculty will say, I'll do a directed study. I can deliver that effectively. Let's make that arrangement. By comparison, we might have a class in our engineering program. It's got a lab associated with it. You're not going to be able to do a directed study very well in that kind of a situation. Student needs ha hands-on experience. In that situation, we'll make the call to run the class. The student has to have the class. It's necessary for the student to complete the program. The faculty member says, this is the only way the student is really going to learn what the student needs to learn. We'll run it. We do those very selectively. We always do those in dialogue and in conversation with, with, with the division. I attempted to try to cover a lot of material in a fairly compact way, uh, recognizing that you have been in some form of conversation for quite some time this evening. Um, I'm happy to go into further detail on, on any of your questions related to scheduling but I hope that is of some use to kind of give an overview of what the process is and what some particular triggers are for our decision-making process uh, when, when we are, are working with students. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Briggs? Thank Christy? you, Mr. Chair. Uh, could you mind just sending our, your PowerPoint to us? Of course. Shannon. Thank you. I think you've done a very good job. And um, I didn't... I mean, I've seen something similar to this before, but it's really good information for a refresher and certainly for our new board members. Um, I wish you well. Won't get to talk with you again, probably. Thank you to your service for NIC, and I hope that you're headed for really green pastures. Thank you. Trustee Howard. Dr. Briggs. Sure. Um, in your opening, you talked about coordination, and um, that's sort of the starting point is to coordinate all this stuff. And we have had a tremendous growth in dual credit over the last four or five years. And that would involve coordination, not just internally, um, but also with high schools and other institutions, because students are coming in sometimes for one or two courses, and sometimes they're taking the whole program so they can get their AA degree. Would you just talk a little bit about the issues involved in coordinating with other institutions? Uh, how does that fit into your description? Uh, Trustee Howard, uh, yes. Yeah. So we offer a combination of classes that students may take here on campus and classes that the student may take at his or her, his or high, her high school. Among the things that are critical uh, is who's teaching that class at the high school if it is not an NIC faculty member here on campus. And we follow guidelines that are national guidelines to be sure that that person is well qualified to teach that material and that there is a mentoring process so that there is time, effort, energy, attention by the faculty, I'll just say psychology as a, as a, as a for instance. We, we might have a psychology faculty here who will mentor and help ensure that that individual high school faculty member is well versed on the course 
It is always an NIC course. That's a very critical element that's associated with our accreditation. Any class we offer needs to be an NIC class, and so we provide a way to kind of come alongside uh, any, any of those instructors. Certainly, we also are in regular conversation with the counselors at those various high schools about what they see as the demand. It's critically important that students are able to meet any high school requirements that they need to meet, as well as if they're, if they're seeking a certificate or degree from NIC, that those things are, are well coordinated. And sometimes, a decision that might really, really well serve a student for a high school requirement won't be well suited to the college requirement and vice versa. And so there's maybe some conversation around that to help ensure that the student knows what she or he is doing around, around that, that course taking pattern. Thank you. Are there any, are there any other questions for Dr. Briggs? I have just a couple quick ones. And I'll confess later, I'm a little guilty. I was one of the ones that wanted to hear these too because my employee was going to take a class on Fridays, and we'd worked that out the schedule for this semester, and her class got canceled, and she ended up taking her class on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so I had to adjust for her not to be in until about the middle of the day on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so uh, I was curious of the process, but I want to su support her. She has successfully completed your class, so it's all good. Um, and two questions, and, and because of the kind of the two different paradigms that you have. When you have the transition over the Christmas break from one semester to the next, that seems like a cleaner one. And I'm, I'm guessing there's a certain timeline when you have to make that decision by for the courses. And I guess my question there would be, kind of what is that drop dead date out of curiosity? Was this, and, and whether it be a CTE or, a, um, or an academic transfer class, is there kind of a nominal threshold number within the parameters of everything you said, understand there'll be exceptions and, you know, what one-offs and things, but is there kind of a number that you kind of want to see in a class to make it viable, if you will? I mean, I don't know if that's the right word, but. Uh, tr uh, Chair Banducci, I, I think viable is, is an excellent term to describe uh, the decision-making process. And indeed, between the end of fall and beginning of spring, it's a bit of a squeeze because we, we, the, the campus is closed, um, people are uh, in, engaged in all kinds of good things at the end of the year, and then we turn around and <coughs> hit the ground running in, in January. Um, my, my default guidance to the division chairs and directors that I have a chance to work with is we really need to make that decision at least a week in advance of the start of the term whenever possible. Generally, those decisions are made well in advance of that, again, to give a student an opportunity to make, to make adjustments, but sometimes it, it gets really tight, and that is a time of year where sometimes it's, it's, it's a little rough and not quite what we would, we would like it to be. In terms of a number, uh, we generally give a guide of we're looking for 12 students in a section to run it. Um, that, does, that does vary. Some of the, some of the examples that, uh, that, that I shared we may be well below 10 and, and, and run a section. Uh, there have been times when we've even had fewer, fewer than that in some sections because it was the only way to ensure that the students got what they needed. Is, is, I'm curious, is that often in the CTE world where you end up with smaller or is it kind of across the board? Uh, I, I would I would defer to my, my colleague uh, Christy Doyle for for uh, specific that was just a specific specifics on that and, and um, uh, probably Dr. Burns can speak to that uh, much more effectively than I can. I was just hesitating to see if Christy popped up, um, but let me respond to that question, um, Chair Banducci. The CTE world is a little bit different than and more expensive to teach too. So. It is more expensive to teach, but because. Yeah those programs are established that one course typically builds on another course. Unless it is one of the general studies courses that support the CTE certificate or degree, um, generally we, we really don't cancel the CTE courses for roll, low enrollment. So um, yes, if it is a gen ed that is supporting, yes, we, we will, or we'll find an alternative as uh, Dr. Briggs described in, in this explanation. But it's very difficult for us to cancel one of those courses because it would set them behind an entire semester. Uh, one more, uh, two more questions, one real quick. You mentioned about enrolling folks for the fall. So very different paradigm, you go from the spring semester to the fall because we have the summer term. How do you, 
first off, kudos, because I don't know how you keep that straight, because you've got some probably that are doing summer and fall, summer, fall, summer, summer. So, I mean, that must be kind of quite the uh, on-ramp and off-ramp at that point. More challenging, I'm guessing, to figure out classes and how you turn that around for the summer versus but maybe more time to figure out the fall? Uh, there's, a little more, there's a little more grace in the schedule uh, when, when we build uh, a fall, April opening, uh, and then work it through through the summer and are, are able to make make adjustments. Are you basically enrolling at the same time summer and and fall? Or? Cor correct. Okay. Yes. Yep. Interesting. Yes, ma'am. If I may make one comment in terms of cancellation for low enrollment, um, as you are well aware that the college received uh, funds, CARES funds, due to the COVID pandemic. That did allow us this past spring and will allow us in the fall to uh, run classes with a lower enrollment than we, we typically do because we will have um, the opportunity to offset the loss of revenue from those with, with CARES funding. So um, this is really important to us as we were talking about that balance of making sure we sustain enough courses to attract students into them. If we canceled all our low enrollment classes, then we might get to a place towards the end of the summer um, and get a flood of students wanting to come to us and we wouldn't have courses for them. And so I think this year as we're going into the fall, we will probably make additional adjustments to this process that has been described to allow for um, lower enrolled courses. Again, just trying to accommodate those students who absolutely want to come and this might be their only opportunity to get into those courses that have been um, scheduled. And if I may share one thought, and I'm sure you guys have processes and procedures in place. With the employee I was mentioning, one of the short-term challenges or concerns, and it was resolved, was that they had gotten their class and had gotten and purchased, or purchased the textbook, which was not inexpensive, and then ended up, maybe ended up, was gonna end up with a different instructor who did not use the same textbook. And I think as it worked out, going from the Friday to the Tuesday, Thursday, I think she was able to maintain the instructor or get an instructor that did use the same textbook. So, I mean, that's always one of the considerations too, that we just make sure nobody ends up with something or, and I think, I think you and I, Lita, had talked about that, where you guys would take that back if that was the occurrence or something. Yeah, so, I know it's a challenge. But uh, anyway, thank you, you guys are doing a great job. Are there, are there any more questions? Or, no, you have another question. I, I simply uh, wanted to take an opportunity to publicly thank uh, the college for the opportunity to be part of this community. Uh, I'm a first-generation college kid. I've had fantastically positive influences in my life, um, so very fortunate around that. And uh, I will say that the people that I've worked with here uh, bring their heart and soul to this institution. And uh, I especially want to thank Dr. Lita Burns, who. Uh, took a, 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 bit of a, a bit of a risk on me, someone with uh, very little community college experience uh, when I started at the, at the institution. So um, if uh, I've done anything to help leave this place a little better than when I found it, uh, it is a reflection of the people that I've had a chance to work with and uh, it's been a pleasure, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you for your service. And happy retirement. Uh, my turn, I don't have a lot to say. I just want to wish our recent graduates all the best as they embark on their, on their future endeavors. And uh, I just wish them well and hope that they're able to find success and happiness. So it's a big, big world out there. Good luck and Godspeed. Uh, we have remarks for the good of the order. Uh, Trustee Barnes is gonna give us a couple things today. Uh, gonna hear a little bit about K-Tech Excited to hear about that, and then he's going to uh, read uh, what the uh, board has put together for the uh, accreditation, accreditation response. Michael, if you would, sir. Thank you. So, and, and thank you for the opportunity to make up for my absence the last time I had a chance to catch up with uh, KTEC and, and Colby Matia, and he was uh, very exuberant about some of the things that uh, I'm passing on to you. Uh, the staff or the uh, board approved um, starting uh, staffing for the year. My eyes are getting already tired. Um, and um, enrollments are, to quote him, through the roof. He was very excited about that. And those programs are growing. And the board also approved uh, the expansion of the welding and auto program. So that's exciting. 
He also shared with me that this uh, Friday they are hosting the Health Professional Job Fair, and uh, I am looking forward to uh, joining him uh, early Friday morning and, and uh, observing that. So that's exciting. I'm looking forward to getting to know that campus better, getting to know him better, and uh, see what's going on there. All right, my second thing, and I'm going to try to make this uh, fairly quick um, on this reading, I'm going to, uh, with uh, your uh, approval, bypass reciting uh, already established uh, code and, and policies that uh, are also included in the statement. Board statement. The North Idaho College Board of Trustees understands the concerns expressed in the complaint received by the NWCCU which is the subject of its investigation of NIC's fulfillment of eligibility requirements 7, 9, and 16. The board is committed to addressing and resolving these concerns. The board acknowledges that competing views regarding board authority, roles, and responsibilities referenced above have resulted in board actions and actions by individual board members perceived to be directing college operations. The board recognizes that its powers, duties, and limitations are established by statute and policy as outlined below. The board agrees that by board policy, it is a contractual relationship with the president, college operations are appropriately in re the responsibility of the administration. Idaho Code Section 332107, entitled General Powers of the Board of Trustees, lists specific powers of an Idaho Community College Board of Trustees. The statute provides that the powers of the Board of Trustees is to adopt policies and regulations for its own government and the government of the college. There is no specific statutory authority contemplating that a community college Board of Trustees has responsibilities for operational decision making. That power is necessarily vested with the President and administration, leaving the Board the authority and responsibility to develop policies and govern the institution. The legislature gave the Board of Trustees the authority to retain a president for a community college and on the president's recommendation appoint personnel, fix salaries, and prescribe duties. See Idaho Code Section 332109. Consistent with the Idaho statutes, the NIC Board of Trustees has adopted policies regarding the governance and the responsibilities of the board and recognizing difference to the operational authority of the president. NIC Board Policy 2.01.02 uh, Responsibilities and Duties states in relevant part as follows, and that's a part I'm not going to recite. There are 20 bolt points that are um, uh, public record. Also see the standards of good practice in part three of Policy 2.01.02 by policy and the college president has specific operational authority. Again, I'm not gonna recite that policy. Board training. The board recognizes that uh, confusing and competing views regarding board authority, roles, and responsibilities has had an adverse impact, impact on the entire college community. The two newest board members have yet to have any formal board training. Recognizing the importance of the need for training, the board has contracted for a supervised retreat. Board and training will provide an opportunity for both veteran and new trustees to learn and mutually understand the board's authority, roles, and responsibilities. Consultants with Association of Community College Trustees, ACCT, will conduct a full day board retreat on June 12, 2021 to facilitate board development. The board is committed to engaging fully and authentically in its development process which it understands will be an ongoing process of continuous evaluation and action. Reinstate board conduct policy. The board takes seriously all complaints of individual actions and transgressions by board members. It is imperative that all stakeholders have confidence that the board and individual board members fulfill their roles in an ethical manner and that inappropriate board member conduct must be addressed. Board Conduct Policy 2.0110 was adopted in 2020 by the board to provide additional guidance regarding board and trustee conduct. That policy was rescinded in November 2020 and is currently under revision by the direction of the board. The, the, uh, re, re, uh, we have deletion there. The, the deletion of this policy has 
generated concern among the campus constituent groups resulting in expressions of no confidence. Recognizing this need, the board has reinstated policy 2.0110 board conduct uh, as amended uh, during the reading tonight, pending completion and adoption of the revisions now being developed. Consideration of the views of constituent groups, the board values and affirms the legitimate role, both formal and informal, that the faculty, staff, administrators, and students have on matters in which each has a reasonable interest. It understands that the views of these constituent groups must be authentically considered. Recognizing the value of constituent groups and the general public of the board adopted policy 2.01.05 some time ago. The policy provides in relevant part that it will be the practice of the board of trustees to utilize the advice of all interested individuals and groups in solution of its educational and financial concerns. Although the board alone will be the final policy agent. The president is North Idaho College's official voice and the general agent through whom members of the college community, <coughs> faculty, staff, and students normally address communication to the Board of Trustees. These presidential functions are established in custom and in board policy. It is therefore regular operating procedure for official communications to the Board of Trustees that originate within the North Idaho College to be routed through administrative channels. It is the policy of the board that the faculty and staff use their respective governance structure in bringing matters of interest before the board. As such, they should report their concerns, suggestions, etc., to their immediate supervisor or committee representative and request that they be carried forth through the appropriate communication channels to the board by the president or the president's designee if necessary. Relevant to the current complaint, the board has reviewed the resolutions it received from the faculty and staff assemblies, the College Senate, and the Associated Students of North Idaho College. The board is addressing these concerns through the training addressed above, the acknowledgments made in this response, and the board's readoption of policy 2.0110. Address board of leadership. Address board, uh, excuse me, address board leadership. The board recognizes <coughs> that the complaint references allegations of significant misconduct by the board chair. Specific details of the alleged misconduct are largely contained in two communications received by the board from the college president. As such, the board is committed to working through the issues raised by the president in order to satisfactorily address the scope of the NC NWCCU investigation. The board agrees to readdress the board leadership roles. And that is the completion of that statement. Mr. Chair. Trustee Howard. Um, it, since we can only um, engage in um, our conduct in public, it, I think it's important for us to each acknowledge whether we adopt the uh, document that's just been read by Trustee Barnes so that we can sign it. and, and um, we. We've, we've had our public um, uh, hearing on it. So I, w I guess I would move to adopt the, the um, document entitled Board Statement, R-E-N-W-C-C-U Investigation. Can I borrow your notebook for a second? I guess just for <clears throat> clarification, put it right up for the, t the TV here. It's got the five signatures of the Board of Trustees on there. So to uh, Trustee Howard's point, we will all be signing this document and uh, submitting it together. As Mr. Board. Chair, I have a question for uh, yes, you or the um, uh, uh, Mr. Lyons. Um, is it appropriate to use uh, DocuSign uh, features to pass the document for uh, official signature or do we we need to fat pass a physical copy. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Trustee Barnes, um, the, a couple of points I'd like to make here. One is it's not really an action item, but it is a statement that has been uh, created, as, as I understand, by Trustees uh, uh, Howard and, and, and Barnes. And I think what you're looking for here is not so much a motion to adopt this here, but a, a statement of, of from each of the board members that that they will 
uh, agree with this statement and sign it so that it can be put out to the community and to address the investigation. That's one. And the second part is, if you want to use the DocuSign approach, um, I think that's, that will work as well. Okay. So that's appropriate. And, and but, just to piggyback on Mr. Lyons, um, Trustee Howard and Trustee Barnes graciously allowed the rest of the trustees to uh, interact with them on that and, and provide input on that document. So uh, they, they built the foundation of it and the bulk of it and, and the framework, but I'd like to think of it as a, a collaborative effort at that point. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I think it would be helpful if each of the board members uh, at least acknowledged uh, their, their consent to this statement and then, then later the, the, the draft can be circulated in one way, one form or another for uh, signa signature. Okay. Did somebody else? Sorry. Let me just say that uh, I adopt the board statement as presented and agree to sign it when presented to me. Okay. I'll, I'll again say I adopt the statement and look forward to signing it. I adopt and will sign. No, I adopt and will sign. I adopt and will sign. Okay. <clears throat> Can we adjourn then? No, no, actually, I, I want to hear what he says, but I want to see if anybody else has anything else for the good of the order. I'd love to end on something happy. We have something, but we don't. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Banducci. I apologize. I don't know if this is going to be happy. I hope it's neutral. Uh, <laughs> but I was, I was asked earlier this evening, uh, relative to the board statement, uh, in terms of the uh, process and outcome of the uh, the complaint the college is developing its response to and uh, I, I answered that question uh, and that it, it, it certainly is a step in a, in a direction to lead us to a positive outcome uh, for sure but I want to remind the board also uh, as I uh, advised uh, last month uh, uh, that what we're going to be required to do, the, the, our response is strengthened by evidence. Uh, and so where, where we have indicated actions, future actions to be taken, uh, it, it, we, will, we will need to provide evidence that, that we've actually fulfilled those things. So the reason I bring that up here is in terms of any, I don't I can't predict or anticipate any action by the by the Co Commission on Colleges and Universities but I do know that they're pretty they are steadfast in the evidence role in certain documenting the college's fulfillment of the standards the accreditation standards and its meeting of the eligibility requirements so I I, I suspect that um, we're not going to quite uh, we're not dialing that all the way in with, with this statement tonight, and I didn't anticipate that we would, but I think it's a really good step in the right direction uh, uh, to get us on track to do that, so uh, you have my appreciation for that. There, that's a little positive. I have one last statement. Trustee Barr. I am excited to be here without a mask. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm are looking we. forward to spending some time on campus and getting to know everybody. So thank you. We'll go with that as a happy ending. I declare the meeting adjourned.